You know, anyone that goes out into the world on a daily basis hopefully looks around and sees that we have a serious problem in our society with the way people dress. Um, The problem of indecent dress is nothing new. Um, You know, I think it uh, heightened itself starting in the 60s and 70s with a little bit more permissive area, and then it's just kind of uh, flowed from there. The world, unfortunately, often influences the church. And in this lesson, this isn't about me saying this is what a Christian can wear. I mean, that's not what this is. And I've heard people preach that sermon that, this, you know, Scripture says it has to be this and this length. And that's not what we're doing here. Uh, but I do want us in this lesson to think about um, how... Dress should be and how we should talk to people about dress. And I know none of you have an issue with this that's sitting in this room currently. But I also understand that we need to have some knowledge and some information so that we can help because we all have kids and grandkids and some great-grandkids maybe that may need to understand some of these lessons. And so that's my goal uh, with this lesson. We want to show that Christians, whether men or women, and this is not a lesson that's throwing uh, women under the bus because men are just as guilty of not dressing correctly as women are. We need to know that there is an acceptable standard of dress and it's not dictated by the fashion world in Paris or New York or wherever. It's dictated by what God has told us. Psalm 119 verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Heaven's decree doesn't change. It has been settled. And what God has told us about standards and what a Christian needs to know for how to dress um, is in Scripture, and it hasn't changed. So what is God's standard of dress for a a Christian? And that's what we're going to look at today. If you want to turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and it's a Scripture that a lot of people use, um, and it's one that that's the reason it was written. Uh, 1 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 9. And it says, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Uh, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with (coughs) self-control. We're going to look at this scripture, and I want us to note some things. And really what's said here applies to men and women together. The thought behind it is what we are looking at, and that's what I want us to look at this morning. So when we look at dress, uh, number one, first of all, we are told it is to be modest. It is to be modest. Uh, the, The meaning of the Greek word for modest is orderly and well arranged. That's one meaning of the Greek word. So some people will argue that Paul here just instructed women to dress neatly. She's just to dress neatly and in order. Well, I don't know about you, but I can't comprehend that Paul would condemn a woman who wore baggy sweatpants one day and then exonerated a woman parading around in a bikini even though that bikini was orderly and the thought doesn't make sense, right? And that, that's what I'm getting at. That, that definition is, is a definition people will pull out for that word, but that's not what he's talking about. This, this verse is not talking about orderly or well-arranged because you can have orderly and well-arranged clothing and it not be modest. <laughs> um. The secondary meaning of the word from the Greek is decent. 
And that's the word that's being used here, decent. Yeah, decent. And when we're talking about decent, uh, what is decent dressed? A dress, and, and we're not going to give a detailed list of clothing. We're not going to give a criteria. <coughs> we're not going to say this is what you have to wear. But when we talk about decent, this is pertaining to the heart. This is an attitude. When we are talking about modest dress, we are talking about the attitude of the heart and what that portrays. It's not about saying, uh, you know, it has to cover this shoulder and has to cover this knee and it has to. That's not what it means. It means that it's decent and it's talking about the heart here. So that's the first thing. It has to be modest. But secondly, dress needs to be with propriety. That's what the scripture says. With propriety. That word is literally shamefacedness. Shame facedness. The definition of that is a sense of shame. So when you talk about somebody's dress, it means to be modest with a sense of shame. A person who dresses with propriety is directed by that sense of shame. And they are rooted in their character, and that character prevents them from dressing shamefully. And that's the literal meaning of the word. Doing so modestly and and using your heart and your attitude to understand that sense of shame. And what is shameful and what isn't. So what is shameful? Well, Revelation 3 and verse 18, I counsel you to buy, from me, uh, to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And again, this is talking in a, in a spiritual sense, but we see shamefulness being attached to nakedness. So what is it telling us about our sense of shame? Our sense of shame, shameful dress, equates with nakedness. Well, we see that Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, they hear God there and they they knew that they were naked. And God says, where were you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I went and hid myself. They were ashamed because they were naked. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? So Adam and Eve hid themselves because they were afraid they were naked. This scripture here, we see the... um, (laughs) They had clothed themselves a little bit, but they still felt naked. God covered them then with tunics of skin. So they were naked in their own eyes. They were naked in God's eyes. And so God covered them with tunics of skin. Tunic was a garment meaning to cover. It is the whole point of it. A tunic is a garment meaning to cover. So a kimono-like inner garment that reached to the knees or ankles, it was worn next to the skin. Both men and women wore tunics made from cotton, linen, or wool. Uh, The earliest were made without sleeves, reached only to the knees. Um, The inner garment was extended to the wrists and ankles later on. Uh, Had long sleeves extended down to the ankles when worn as a dress. Uh, Hard-working men, slaves, and prisoners wore them abbreviated to their knees and without sleeves. Now... That's the definition from Bible times. We understand that. That was the consensus of what covered meant was from shoulders past the knees. Isaiah 47 verses 1 through 3 talks about the covering of the thigh. Um, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no more be called tender and delicate. 
Take the millstones and grind meal. Remove your veil. Take off the skirt. Uncover the thigh past the rivers. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. Yes, your shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance and I will not arbitrate with a man. So we see here when God is talking about uh, this, he's talking about when you uncover the thigh, that it's nakedness. It says, show your nakedness when you uncover the thigh. Now again, we're not getting into the this length, that length, whatever. But I do want us to understand the principle behind it. Adam and Eve were shamefully, immodestly dressed. And when God covered them, they were no longer naked. So what I want us to think about is when we talk about that shame Facedness, us having a sense of shame, Where, what does that apply to when we start talking about the shorts that we see people wearing today? And I'm talking men and women, because I have seen some horrendous shorts and pants on men. And this doesn't just apply to length. And uncoveredness, and it replies to tightness, right? And, and we laugh and chuckle about this, but this is something that our world doesn't understand. Because that sense of shame has gone out the window. I feel weird when I have to go into a doctor's office and take off my shirt. I, I do. It bothers me. I don't like it. It's the sense of, again, this is the sense of shame, right? This is what, uh, that sense of shame that should help us. So what, when we start talking about tight-knit clothing, we start talking about see-through clothing, we start talking about, you know, it's supposed to be 90-something degrees tomorrow, the little shorts have come out. But when we talk about things that completely cover, what about this fad right now that we wear leggings everywhere? We wear leggings that show every curve and mole that's on the back of somebody's leg. And I'm exaggerating a little bit, but we wear tight. And it originally was something that was made to wear a long sweatshirt or a long shirt over. And the long shirts have gone by the wayside. And now it's just we wear leggings everywhere. For a man... To dress immodestly is lasciviousness. Galatians 5 verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evidence which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, lasciviousness is, is in there. These are works of the flesh. So when a man dresses immodestly, it's lasciviousness. When a woman dresses immodestly, it's lasciviousness. Again, think about what he's talking about in Isaiah when he's talking about uncovering the thigh and showing yourself to be a harlot. And that's the whole point. When you declothe yourself to that point, showing off everything about your body, you are treating your body like a harlot, is what it's saying. We need to make sure that that shamefacedness plays a part uh, in our dress. Does it bother us? That's with propriety. Like I said, I do not walk out of my house without a shirt on. And I know that's very common for men to do so. I don't. I don't like it when basketball teams want to do the shirts versus skins thing. I don't like that. To me, that's not, I, I just don't like it. That's my sense of shame. It bothers me. Um, we need to think about that when we put our clothing on because that's the with propriety. Number three, moderation. Moderation, another word that can be used there is sobriety. Sobriety. So think about that. Think about how we use the word sober and how we use the word sobriety, and that should pay, uh, play into how we dress. Good judgment, moderation, self-control, soundness of mind. The judgment involved should be biblically-based judgment. 
So it tells us in, in Titus 2 verse 5, it says for the older women to teach the younger women to be discreet and to be chaste. That comes from the same root word, that be discreet comes from the same root word as the word moderation or sobriety. So older women are to teach younger women to be sober or to have moderation in the things that they do. Do we use good judgment in our apparel? Do we use that sobriety? Again, we talk about somebody getting pulled over for a sobriety check. They're checking to see if they can utilize the judgment functions of their body. We're told to do the same thing when it comes to our clothing. We are to use our sobriety. We are to make choices. So we are to be modest. We are to with propriety or shamefacedness. And we are to uh, use... um, We are to use our sobriety or moderation. Number four... He says, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. Oh, no, if you braided your hair, Emily's in trouble. Does the inspired writer here forbid women to wear braids, jewelry, or costly clothing? No. You know, Proverbs 31, verse 10, when it's talking about the virtuous woman here, it says, who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies? Go down to verse 22. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. The scripture says she's clothed in fine linen and purple. And she's a virtuous woman. So no, the Bible's not saying you can't wear fine clothing. It's not saying you can't wear uh, braids. It's not saying you can't wear jewelry. That's not the point of what it's saying here. Paul uses a Jewish figure of speech, the denial of the lesser, to emphasize the greater. So Paul uses that a lot. And in 1 Peter 3.3, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. If if that was taken literally, then we wouldn't put on apparel. Is the, is the way that it's literally written. So Paul here is doing the same thing. It's not literal. Women in Roman society, just as today, were prone to wear elaborate and expensive hairdos. Uh, they would braid the hair with gold or silver strands or laced with gold, silver, or jewels. And they would dress outlandishly. They would dress in these expensive clothing And the point was to draw attention to themselves and to draw attention to their wealth. That was the point. That was why they did it, to draw that attention to themselves. Paul and Peter here in both places are simply teaching women to place the emphasis on where it needs to be. The emphasis is on the hidden uh, person of the heart. 1 Peter 3 verse 4, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. They're saying we need to focus on that heart, but then you also need to focus on good works. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10, but with the, which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. The point here is don't waste your time on primping. Don't misplace your emphasis on designer labels, costly jewelry, fancy hairdos, the the gaudiness. Spend time on developing your godly character and your inward beauty because that's what's beautiful to God. That's the whole point of this. Don't put your focus, this is just like what we talk about, putting our focus on money. Putting our focus on our houses, on our cars, on the things we have. Don't put your focus on the physical beauty because that shouldn't be where all of your focus goes on. Put your focus on yourself, on your heart and the way that you you do things. Now, that doesn't mean that you can never go to the hair salon again. Doesn't mean you can't buy another piece of jewelry. Doesn't mean you can go buy some nice clothing. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying don't let that overtake you. How many people on Sunday morning spend so much time getting themselves ready physically that they're not ready spiritually? 
You ever known those ladies in the congregation that were late every single morning because they couldn't get themselves fully doled up to go to worship? I remember a couple growing up. (laughs) Again, he's saying that's not the point. Quit focusing on that. Focus on the spiritual aspect. So then number five, if we're looking at, at all of, taking all of this, he ends up and says, proper for women, women professing godliness. And I'm going to apply this to both men and women, right? Essentially, all of this is summed up in one thing. You dress in such a way as someone that is professing godliness. Someone who is professing the fear and reverence of God. You have scriptures on that. 1 Timothy 2 verse 10, proper, professing godliness that we just read. But then Proverbs 7 verse 5, that they may keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. And then verse 10 of that same chapter, and there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot. And a crafty heart. The attire of a harlot. Yes, people are, you can tell something about a person by the way they dress. And that's what it's saying. You need to dress as someone who is professing the reverence of God. Mary Quant was the person who introduced the miniskirt in 1964. She was being interviewed one day about her mini skirt that she had created. The quote was, mini skirts are symbolic of those girls who want to seduce a man. She brought out that was the whole point in her introducing the mini skirt. For somebody that wanted to wear it to seduce a man. Is our clothing proper? Is our clothing professing godliness or is our attire the attire of a harlot? Questions that should help us determine that answer. Would you want to see Jesus Christ the way you are dressed? That's a quick and easy way to determine how am I dressed? Would I care if Jesus Christ came down in front of me and saw me dressed the way I'm dressed? Something to think about, right? Secondly, does our clothing cause godly men or women to be tempted to lust? Matthew 5, verses 27, 28, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Matthew 18, verse 6, uh, six. well, let, let's stop right there. Well, it's the person's fault who's doing the lusting. How many times have you heard that from somebody? Well, it's not my fault that the man lusts after me the way I dress. Matthew 18, verse 6, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. What does it say about those of us that cause another brother to stumble? Or another sister to stumble? By causing someone to stumble, we are committing sin just as atrocious. It's not just about the person doing the lusting. It's about what you are doing to cause it. And we need to think about that. Another question, does the way you dress hinder your influence as a Christian? Matthew 5 or 16, Scripture we all know tells us, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If somebody sees the way you are dressed out in public, do they say that's a Christian? Can they see you as a Christian based on the way that you are dressed? Another one, could you teach another concerning a modest dress or clothing dressed the way that you are? The way you are dressed hinders you from teaching or helping somebody else, then there's a problem. Romans 2 verse 21, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? 
You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? In other words, I've got to practice what I preach. So if I'm practicing to profess holiness, am I dressed? professing holiness? Am I dressed in such a way I could walk up to somebody and have a conversation with them about the way they're dressed? Again, some questions that we need to keep in our mind. And this is men and women. Again, I'm not telling you, I'm not going to stand up here and say it has to be this length, this has to be covered. I'm not doing that. That's not the point. The point is for us to ask these questions about the way we are dressed. A girl dressed in a lot of the clothing that we see walking around outside, especially when it gets hot, shorts that are barely down to below the rear end. A lot of times it's the halter tops only now, right? A lot of this type of dress, the leggings that are so tight with nothing nothing covering, men are the same way. Pants the way they are, wearing things that they shouldn't, we have to ask these questions. If somebody looked at me and saw me dressed that way, would they think he's a Christian? Or if somebody said, they're a Christian and they go to that congregation, what's somebody going to think? Because the way we dress has an effect on our church family and it has an effect on Christianity as a whole. We need to watch the way that we dress. Quote was once said, dress like a clown and you will feel like a clown. Dress like the world and you will feel like the world. Dress like a Christian and you will feel like a Christian. Does our clothing reflect godly character? Does our clothing cause other people to stumble? Does our clothing bring shame on God and on his church? Or does it bring glory to him? Because everything we are to do, we are to do to the glory of God. Some hopefully simple questions and things to think about. Again, I know we don't have a problem in this room, but I know we all have family members or friends or people we know that this conversation might need to be had. (laughs) How are we reflecting what type of person we are based upon the way we dress? We live in an extremely immodest world. And I say immodest world. We live in a society today where it seems like the less that can be put on or the tighter that it can be put on is the way it needs to be. I know as a man, I have a hard time clothes shopping today and I can't fathom what it's like for women. Because as a man, I have a hard time finding anything that's not slim or skinny in the store. I'm like, I just want a regular pair of Wranglers like they used to make. You can't find them. I go look for dress shirts. They're all slim. They're all made to pull. I don't want that. (laughs) The coats even are slim. The pants are skinny. So I know it's not just a female problem. It's a male problem too. But that's the world we live in and we need to help combat that. And hopefully that was the point of this lesson. How do we help combat it? Things for us to think about. Things for us to ponder on. But then also ask the questions to yourself. Am I out in a public place and am I dressed in such a manner um, that I reflect God or am I dressed in a manner that reflects the world? And that can apply to me standing in my front yard painting or doing work on a car or something like that because people see me. People see me. People come by. How am I dressed? What do I look like? We need to make sure that we ask those questions. We all stumble and we all fall and we have problems. But God gives us his word so that we can learn, we can grow, we can become better, and we can do better. Um, If there's anything you need this morning, please come as we stand and sing.